Welcome back to Krishna's Laurels. Today we'll be discussing Article 27, 28, and 29. Article 27 talks about freedom from taxation for promotion of a religion. Whereas Article 28 talks about freedom from attending religious instructions. Article 29 says protection of interest of minorities. So let's see in detail what is Article 27. Article 27 is freedom from taxation for promotion of a religion. So here it says that no person shall be compelled. What is compelled in essence? He shouldn't be forced to in essence saying that this is compulsory. You should do it. So no person should be compelled to pay any taxes for promotion or maintenance of any particular religion or religious act, act, uh, denomination like if you are Hindu, you are visiting any temple, you shouldn't be complied to pay so and so amount for promotion of Hinduism, for maintenance of Hinduism, it shouldn't be in compulsion like how we impose income tax, GST, like it is compulsory right, uh, income tax and GST, so it shouldn't be like that no one should levy taxes for promotion and maintenance of any particular religion. In other words, what, what they actually mean is, state should not spend the public money, that is taxes, to promote any particular or to, or to promote or to maintain any particular religion. In essence, government's money should not be spent, that is taxes, what we pay should not be spent on any one particular religion. Uh, for promotion of the that particular religion or for maintenance of that particular religion this prohibition this particular provision provision what do you mean provision the rule or the article says that uh, state should be prohibited from favoring patronizing and supporting one religion in a sense they are saying that state in a sense indian government or particular state government should not favor one particular religion, should not support one particular religion over other religions. In a sense, there should be no discrimination. You should, you can't um, promote or maintain only one particular religion and state should not support like one, uh, or one particular religion and shouldn't ignore others. This means the taxes can be used for promotion and maintenance of all religion. Like overview, like all over you can uh, invest some, some amount of taxes but you can't like favor just will be uh, making uh, mosque or just will be promoting missionaries or like one particular minority religion you can't do that if you want to promote religion you should promote all the religions or else you should not promote any religion here they are saying that state should not focus on any one particular religion because this creates discrimination this provision prohibits only levy of taxes and not a fee what do you mean fee um, uh, sometimes not uh, if we go get into any temple uh, like kind of or something like that they do charge the darshanam ticket and if you stay in their dharamshalas and all they'll charge you maintenance and all it is for uh, them to maintain the temple it is okay they can charge a particular small amount of fee not like a tax that compulsory you should pay it this is because the purpose of fee is to control secular administration of the religious institution administration in essence day-to-day -day, um, expenses or like administration of that particular religious institution and not to promote or maintain the religion if they are charging even a small amount of fee, it should be for administration of that particular institution, institution like temple, mosque, church. But it shouldn't be to promote or maintain the religion. You shouldn't, uh, I mean, those people shouldn't say that you should pay so and so compulsory tax that we can promote our uh, religion like worldwide, we can spread this worldwide. Not like that. It should be only for the secular administration of the religious institution. Just a fee can be levied on the pilgrims to provide them some special services or safety measures like special darshanam, prasadam or what you say, uh, the stay, dharamshalas and all. It, it can be for some special services. A small amount of fee can be levied. Similarly, a fee can be levied on a religious endowments for meeting of the 
regulationary expenditures. So even uh, to like uh, cope up with the uh, regul uh, regulatory expenditures, like uh, if you know Tirupati uh, Palaji uh, Temple does pay taxes, they have regulation uh, uh, regulation expenditures. In a sense, they have accountants. They do file uh, taxes and all. So uh, fees can be even levied on uh, levied on religious endowments. Endowments, in a sense, like. Uh, popular trusts or say temples we have like shirdi sai baba trust tirupati trust these trusts uh, do comply with all the regulation now coming to article 28 which talks about freedom from attending religious inst uh, instruction so no religious instruction shall be provided in, provided in any educational institution so first thing they are saying that in a school or in any college, in any educational institution, there should be no religious instruction given. You shouldn't say you should pray five times uh, like namaz or you should do, you should sing songs, you should do bhajan. It shouldn't be, uh, these kind of instruction should not be given in any educational institution. That to which kind of educational institution? which is wholly maintained out of the state funds. In other words, government schools, government colleges, in those uh, educational institutions, no religious instruction should be given. However, this provision should not, uh, shall not apply to an educational institution administered by the state, but under some established, under any endowment of trust. Like if you know missionary schools, like uh, if you are from Hyderabad, St. Anne's College or something like that, uh, like, if you are in Madrasa, that is only for Muslims. So there they can give religious instruction because it is made under that particular trust. So it is it has been funded by the state, but uh, it is under that minority community or minority trust. So in that institution they can give religious instruction, requiring imparting of religious instruction in such institution. In those in, in such such kind of ins, uh, institution. They can give religious instruction. There is no person attending any educational institution recognized by the state or receiving aid out of state funds shall be required to attend any religious uh, instruction or worship in that institute without its consent. If some Christian kid is in uh, any government school and there's, there's some holy celebration going on, we do right in festivals, different kind of festivals we do celebrate, we eat, we wear new clothes like that. So that guy don't want to get involved. So it's his wish because uh, that particular uh, educational institution is wholly maintained out of the state fund and he has right not to attend any religious instruction. In this case of a minor, if that child is a minor, then the consent of his guardian is needed. Even if say that child is interested to pay, play holy, then his parents should give him permission first to let him go. So guardian's permission is needed. Article 8 distinguishes between four types of educational institutions. So let's see first one is institution wholly maintained out of the state fund. Completely the funding is coming from the government. Institution administered by the state but established under any endowment or trust. So here yes, say we say that Shirdi uh, if you visit a Shirdi you will see some uh, schools under trust, Sai Baba trust. Like those something like that endowment of uh, any kind of trust. Uh, under that uh, institution or the school will be established which will be administered or like uh, an administration is like maintain, maintained by the state. Institution recognized by the status are normal schools, colleges recognized by state ones. Institution receiving aid from state in essence, uh, some kind of subsidies or like uh, a, a small amount say 15 percent 20 percent of investments or like a league um, a financial help was given by the state so these are four kind of first one is like wholly maintained by state in essence it's completely government uh, school or college second one is it is under it, it is made under any trust but the administration is done by the state maintenance and all is done by state that is government third one is it is only recognized by state in a sense it's a private university or private school 
but it, it have been given recognition by a state. Fourth one is institution receiving aid. In a sense, uh, that particular school or college have received some funds or some financial subsidies from the government. In A, that is in first point, religious instruction is completely prohibited in wholly, like wholly maintained uh, by state in a sense, government schools or colleges. There, there should be no religious instructions given. It's completely prohibited. Whereas in second one, religious instruction is permitted. Because we said, right, it is made an, in, under any endowment or any trust, any missionary or in any mother's kind of thing, which is made in, under a trust or endowment. There it is allowed. And in C, that is recognized by state. Uh, and in D, that is receiving aid from state religious instruction is permitted on a voluntary basis if you want you can do just like our private schools we used to celebrate different kind of festivals some people used to uh, participate some people used to don't so, uh, so it depends on on their voluntary basis their will and their wish you can but it depends on the opposite person they want to participate or not So, uh, coming to Article 29, it talks about protection of interest of minorities. So, here in Article 29, it says that Article 29, uh, it, pro it provides any section of citizens residing in any part of India having a distinct language, script or culture of its own shall have right to conserve the same. So, here just focus on the red part, the which will have been colored in red. In Article 29, what they are saying is any section of citizen, whether they are living in any part of India, which, oh, which have distinct language, distinct language in a sense, uh, different languages, which is like very uh rarely used like it's kind it is even treated as linguistically uh, minor uh, minority like if we have a religiously minor uh, minority and even linguist in a sense the languages which have been used by very rare people even uh, those are known as distinct languages script in a sense some kind of script which is like rarely used or the culture which is very different of its own Shall, shall have right to be conserved. So in a sense, uh, we were seeing the interest of minorities, right? So it, uh, minorities is not, not always religion. It also can be a language, script or culture that have been used by very less number of people. And those people have right to conserve their culture, religion, script. Further, no citizen shall be Denied admission into any education institution maintained by state or receiving aid, aid by the state funds on the ground of the religion, race, caste, or language. Just say our Zilla Parishad school, okay? It have been completely maintained by our state. And if any Muslim, Christian, Hindu, whoever goes and asks for admission, it not it will not be denied. On what basis? On basis of race, caste, language, or religion. The first provision protects the right of a group, while the second provision, the provision guarantees the right of an individual citizen. So first we were saying that a section of citizens, section of citizens in a sense, a community, a tribe. But whereas coming to the second point, it, it talks about a particular citizen, not a group. So uh, here a right of a citizen as an individual irrespective of the community to which he belongs in a sense. The second point is talking about only an individual and first one is talking about the whole section or whole community. Article 29 grants protection to the both religious minorities as well as linguist minorities. What is linguistic? In a sense, a different kind of language used by people, different culture, different sets of traditions. So even those people are treated as minorities. However, the Supreme Court held that scope of this of this article is not necessarily restricted or uh, to only minorities, that is Christians, Jews, Parsis, Sikhs, as it's commonly assumed. The first thing what it comes in our mind saying minorities, obviously Christians, Muslims, Jews, 
Parsis, but it's not the case. Supreme Court said that the scope of this particular uh, Article 29 is a bit wide and minorities doesn't mean only religious minorities. This is because of the uh, use of the word section of citizens in this article that includes minorities as well as majority. The Supreme Court also had th held that right to conserve the language includes the right to agitate for the protection of the language as well. So here the first thing what they are saying is section of uh, citizens is also covering other people as well, majorities as well. It doesn't mean this article is only protecting minorities rights but even if a majority, a Hindu is saying that my so and so culture is uh, about to extinguish, I want to protect my culture, I want to protect my language, they can do that. It, it doesn't mean if they are majority, they can't protect their uh, culture or their language or something like that. It, it have all, also been granted to majority as well. But in the article, it does look like this is only permitted to the minorities, but these rights are also guaranteed for the majority as well. The Supreme Court held that the right to co conserve the language includes even to educate in essence to like spread uh, to propagate to spread awareness uh, regarding the protection of a language hence the political speeches or promises made by made for co conservation of a language of a section of the citizen does not amount to corrupt practice under the representation of people act so here uh, when election at election times you know right people what, what do you say? A politician gives speeches like, we'll do the, this thing for Muslims, we'll do this things for Hindus. Sometimes um, those things are not allowed to them to speak like that, like only favoring one particular religion and uh, focusing on one particular uh, religion as a motive. But when it comes to protection of any culture, language, saying that I'll protect this particular language because I belong from uh, this area, this is my motherland. He can do that. This is not a corrupt practice. Corrupt practice and a representation of people act. So hopefully this is clear. Do you people know what is representation of people act 1951? If you have any idea, just send a one line explanation about it and drop it in a comment box. There's huge discount going on in Mega Mock Test Series for TS and AP Law 2024. Enroll now. Link, for, link is in description box. You can just ping us on Instagram. Instagram handle is mentioned here or it's in Telegram.